what we just heard there were the uh, beautiful sounds of a team of fat bikers up by James Bay. We're going to hear more from these guys later in this episode. Dan, how's it going? It's good. It's good. I uh, am now a certified. You are certified track rider at oh, yeah. the Milton Velodrome now. Congratulations! You went roundy round, round a lot and this round. past few weekends. It was sweet. I gotta say, I am sorry I didn't do that sooner. Oh, so you're buying a new bike soon, are you? And plus more problems, right? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, we have a, a different kind of bike we're looking at, a tandem ride this episode. Now, I've never been a, uh, a tandem man myself, no, uh, no. nor have I experienced one. But this one looks like a pretty way, pretty good way to get used to riding a tandem. Uh, they pretty much had to get used to it. It was a father and son. They rode from Nova Scotia to uh, Soyuz, BC. And the trip was a while ago, but uh, their takeaways from it are pretty cool about just like starting an o- your own adventure and just, you know, having the right attitude for, for trying something that you might be in over your head on. You rode with your pa this weekend. How would the, uh, the tandem fat biking have gone? Oh, no, no. My father and I went fat biking and we had our own bikes and that's the way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the way to do it. <laughs> All right, next on the show. Uh, Full send, no send. Oh, yeah, it's back. It's back. Always back. We got some hot takes. Yep, we got a recap of sorts from the Zwift National Championships. (laughs) That's right. Uh, Then we talk about the newfound success of Team Astana, everyone's favorite team run by a Bond villain. (laughs) That's my line. You stole my line. That's a great line, though. Uh, And then we talk about the upcoming Track World Championships. Give them some shine. Or do we? Uh, And then we will hear from everybody's favorite hard man, Swain Tuft. Yeah, I I recently saw the documentary Wonderful Losers, where he plays a starring role in an ice bath. Um, Probably my favorite part of the movie is Swain in the ice bath, and then his camping on a cliff after. As he does. As he does. All right, let's get into it. A few episodes ago, we spoke with Buck Miller and Ted King. These were two of four riders in the James Bay Descent. They previewed this ride for us and the uh, 600 kilometers they would do on fat bikes across northern Ontario. They're back. They made it. And they brought with them uh, sounds and tales from their adventures. Let's listen to Buck and Ted and some of their... uh, fellow riders, Eric Capati and Ryan Atkins. Ten after five on the evening of night five. Look at a beautiful sunset on South Bluff Creek on the Wheaton Winter Road. Uh, the road's not open to traffic, but we we jumped out anyway, and we made it uh, 50 kilometers today. And this is the creek I actually had my um, bachelor party on. My brother-in-law was the only guy that could make it, obviously, because we lived in the middle of nowhere, Moose Knee. We went up South Bluff Creek. Uh, a long way in a canoe, fishing and camping for the whole long weekend, July long weekend, and now we're we're camping right beside on bikes. Super windy, crazy hard headwind today. Ted and uh, Ted pretty well sat in the front for the whole 50k. We left late at, I think we left to cut on the road at like 10:30, and stopped riding at four. And yeah, we got the tent up, built a big. Snow wall windbreak out of big hard blown ice or snow snow chunks. Pile the bikes up and hopefully that'll do for tonight. We're gonna put the wood stove in, warm up, and go to bed. So, uh, our first day we had some issues in the uh, tent department. Um, it's pretty cold out. Our thermometers bottomed out at minus 30, and uh, it was uh, quite a bit colder than that, so I'm not sure how cold it really got, but suffice to say it was cold. And uh, Lights out. our hot tent was a little bit not that hot. Um, we were just burning some alders that were pretty green. Alder, alder is like is the 
choice wood for smoking meat for indigenous people because it doesn't burn well. Yeah. That's yeah. all we had. We're yeah, on we, the shore of James Bay. We can attest to that. Um, yeah, so everybody got pretty cold overnight, uh, varying various degrees. Um, but, you know, we all survived, got up, headed out of the bay, checked it out a bit. Uh, we were told by multiple uh, locals, uh, indigenous people, that um, it was unsafe to head out onto the water, open water. They don't re recommend it. We kind of went out there and poked around, ran into another guy who kind of said, wasn't the greatest idea. Uh, we rode our bikes out a bit on some of the ice to get a feel of what riding was like. And, you know, you'd ride for uh, 10 meters and it'd be nice and hard. And then you'd get a soft patch and it would be like super tough and um, just bumpy. And our bikes are so loaded that we, we were pretty worried we were going to break something. Um, we had so much weight on the racks and panniers and stuff. Yeah, our, ra our racks are, are retrofits, universal fit racks for bikes with that'll go, you know, they'll fit on any bike. So they don't have, our bikes don't have touring mounts, right? Yeah. So they're kind of a bit wibbly wobbly. And uh, yeah, so we decided that it was probably unsafe. Uh, if someone fell in the open water, it'd probably, you know, the end of them. Um, 5k from shore where there's no firewood anyway. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we turned around and headed back to Attawapiskat and rode through town and then got started on the uh, winter road heading south. So now we're camped out on the winter road and, uh, yeah, doing good. Yeah. So for the record, Ted's been sleeping. He slept last night and it was really cold last night. Uh, and he slept with the top of his sleeping bag, <laughs> the, the strings wide open. I didn't know there were strings. He, he didn't know there were strings <laughs> on, the sleep, on these mummy sleeping bags to sense them shut around your neck. So the poor guy was frozen terribly, like, you know, very badly. Like, he, had a, he didn't sleep at all. I, we all felt pretty bad. We still do. Uh, I spent last night shivering in a body bag. And I, I said to the guys, I believe it was my... It started off my top 10 worst nights ever sleeping in the bush. And it's the more I thought about it, it entered the top five. It's like fifth or fourth for sure. The worst nights I've ever slept outside. I was just freezing cold. I was in my bag for like 13 hours. I, mean, I, was, I just couldn't get warm. Um, so, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been tough, but spirits are high now. We're pretty cozy in a, in a little tent uh, on the side of the road. Looking forward to tomorrow. Day three behind us. Day four ahead of us. Started off magnificently when my uh, when my pannier rack decided to nearly self combust on my bike. That was less opportune, mostly by user error. Man, based on what I saw on Ted's bike today, like thank goodness we didn't go down the bay because all our panniers would have fallen off. I agree with that. The just the bump, the braking bumps on the road are, in, Dude, I, they're ice, and we're still riding the silky part. And even like the 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 bulldozer tracks, yeah, like get all it's crazy, yeah. And this road's beautiful compared to the weed yeah, road. Yeah, we've got so much weight on them. They're overweight, like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So. But you can't be underweight and have enough to live in forty below for ten days. Yeah. Through some very quick thinking. Which took about 85k to think of. I wrapped a tube around my seat stay. We cut one of our good tubes up. Oh yeah. Well, so now oh. we're down to three. It was not an ultralight, so it was probably only like a twenty dollar tube. Uh, but that gave it some wicked grip. So pleased with that decision. Uh, this took place at. Uh, we all rolled out. There's a. Neutral start. Oh, yeah, we've broken it into two teams. Yeah. Let's tell them about the teams. And then right off the gun. Um, it's breakaway happened. Yeah, Ted and I got some distance. And, you know, once we realized we had a gap, we just kept going. And uh, a couple, couple mechanicals, uh, we almost got caught. By the get, well, Ted got caught. Yeah, we did catch Ted. But then he quickly attacked. Yeah. Put the hammer down, left the Gruppetto behind. <laughs> yeah, and then we uh, decided to take a counter move into a cache and and then that's when cool. 
that's when the that's when the, the Gruppetto passed you guys again. That's when the danger happened. Yeah. Because it's a okay two and a half k, three k, call it four k, into cash, which yeah. only took one detour and asking two people. Go there for what should have been a 15 minute stop, which probably was closer to 45. Get rolling again. What? Seven wrong turns? Yeah. We, <laughs> um, we kept asking people where to go, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, you just go that way. And they'd kind of point, and we'd be like, okay, we start riding that way, and we'd do the wrong turn. And we feel like we're asking pretty basic directions, like, can we go, how do you get to the winter road? And it takes them a lot of time to think about it. It's like, isn't it a pretty obvious route? Like, we're yeah, asking like, where, where the where main highway go. is. <laughs> the only highway. <laughs> yeah. The only road in and out. We're just over halfway from out of Wapiscot to Moosonee. And there's snow in the forecast, which I think we'll we're suck. concerned of. Just because now they're calling for up to 35 centimeters of snow or 40 centimeters. So that's the going was pretty good today. We had a little bit of a headwind out of the south, southwest, then south and southeast. Not bad, but just enough to just enough to slow you down, especially when you're pedaling a hundred pound bike. But yeah, it's a good day. Day five. Day five. Day five. I think so. Here we are, dispatches from the road. We're on the Weedham Road, and uh, it's close to vehicles right now because of all the snow we got. But you know, technically we're not cars, so they let us go, and we're cruising down south. Um, Going is good, a little snowy, a little blustery, but we got a bit of a tailwind. Sun's out, gun's out, and we're just cruising. It's great. Thinking 30K is a big day. We don't really know how, how much you can do today. The road's pretty slow. Yeah, the road's definitely not quick. We're pushing a little snow, you know, a couple centimeters. Um, super hard, crispy, crunchy snow, uh, but it's okay. Boom. Well, we made Five, the... Five, four, look at the camera. Taking a picture for the Native Friendship Center. Yes, boys. Yo, yo. Say hi uh, to the peeps, ow. the Canadian Cycling oh, Magazine are... podcast. We are... I just did the hip. jacket up on my freaking beard. So we made it to the Moose Knee Friendship Center. Hip deep snow. Six grand we raised. There's like a full-on blizzard. It's a real blizzard too, by northern standards. We've got a crowd here watching us. We've got a crowd here watching us. Just visited a school. Yeah. Went this to Moose Knee Public School, said hello. The only place uh, I think, uh, no, one of the few places you can bring a 12 gauge shotgun into the school. Boy. Okay, let's uh, let's just do a serious yeah. picture so we don't no, lose this one. Video. We got a picture already. Oh, okay, this sweet. Should we do like a few okay. pictures? It is three, like, you know, we'll do that again. Those. Yeah, that works. We can use the... Those were the voices of Buck Miller, Ted King, Eric Batty, and Ryan Atkins. They were all members of the James Bay Descent. It was a trip across northern Ontario and they also raised money for the Moosonee office of the Timmins Native Friendship Centre. Hey, Matt. What's up? We got a sponsor. Oh, that's great. Who is it? Well, they're challenging you to do something epic. It's the Ride to Conquer Cancer, Canada's largest cycling fundraiser. That's awesome. No, this is a, a very cool event um, because it's a great charity, but it's also a great ride, and it's a ride that can get riders of all kind involved. Yeah, so it's two days, over 200 kilometers, so that's a good challenge, and you know what? That makes it worth it, you know, all that training you're doing right now in the winter. Something like this is a great goal to shoot for. Right. So you sign up and you can raise vital funds to support cancer research, treatment advances, education, and new standards of care at cancer centers and research facilities across Canada. So as you probably know, almost one in two Canadians will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. And this is one of those charities that's going to have you riding to change that. So what should people do, Dan? Register today at conquercancer.ca and save $50 when you use the promo code podcast at sign up. Again, that's promo code podcast, P-O-D-C-A-S-T at conquercancer.ca.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Full Send, No Send. Adam, is your thumb ready? My thumb is ready, and three, two, one, go. All right, Matthew, this weekend, it was the inaugural, not inaugural, but second annual Zwift National Championship weekend. Amazing. Canada, as you know, had its own, being a winter nation. We have two champions now. Yes. Congrats to Stephanie Osenbrink and Warren Muir, both of uh, BC and Alberta, respectively. Nice. Yeah. I want to talk about Warren's stats here. Pretty impressive. Average 4.6 watts per kilo, peaking with a 60 with a 16 watts per kilo one minute average. Some pretty solid numbers. And Not too shabby. He took down some pretty big names in the Canadian cycling world. Really? A Nick Zerkowski of Uh-oh. Floyd's. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, you might know a Lionel Sanders of the triathlon world. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Trainer, rider, extraordinaire. Yeah. And uh, Derek St. John of CrossFit. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, now, what's your full send, no send on this? Or what's your what's your angle here? I'm full send on it. I think uh, the only problem yes. is where do you wear the jersey? Now, which jersey? Your digital jersey? Your, do you wear an IRL E championship digital jersey? Like, Can you wear that on your trainer? I think that's the only place to wear because you're not going to wear it in a road race outside. You're not going to wear it in a time trial outside or a crit. So that pretty much leaves your uh, custom IRL jersey for you in your pain cave. So, okay, here's the real question, though. Are you even allowed... That's not a real question, but are you allowed <laughs> to even wear it or can you only wear a pixelated digital version? What are you talking... Like, are we talking in... Only Zwift? your avatar can wear it? Are you not actually allowed to wear it because you're not in the game? Oh, man, this is, this is an epistemological problem that I'm not ready for. You know what? So creators of Zwift. Or maybe it's a metaphysical problem. Let's get let's hear from the creators of Zwift. It's a philosophical problem. Yeah. I want to hear from from the game designers. What should we do? What's the etiquette here? Get back to us. All yeah, right. okay. Okay, uh, moving on. Moving podcast on. at cyclingmagazine.ca. Um okay, here's a here's a is it okay to like Astana now? So Astana has um a stellar has had a stellar February. Yes. Um they um I'm just trying to pull up their stats here. They've they've been winning yes. like a lot. And what is it about winning that makes you go, hmm, okay, maybe you have a Bond villain for a, a team principal. Yep. But suddenly, oh, uh, uh, you okay, know, so oh, Jakob Fuglzang winning at Vuelta Andalusia. You've got a bunch of stage the Izagari, wins. The Izagari at, brothers uh, Oman. winning a whole bunch of things as yep. well. Um, you know, maybe it's also that they've got a good Canadian connection. That that is a part. That was where the 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 Astana thaw started for me. Yeah, um, is uh, Hugo Hul. Yeah, it's like Hugo. He's a good kid. He carries his own stuff. You know, it couldn't be that bad. <laughs> That's right. So I'm I'm trying to reconcile myself with Astana. I don't know. I don't know if I can be full send Astana ra 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 yet because I don't know. Okay, I've spent so long being at least ambivalent towards that team. Okay, here's what here's what would do it for me. Hugo Hull, spokesman for Quebec Maple Syrup. Quebec Maple, Maple Syrup sponsors Team Astana. Then there's the Team Maple Syrup. And what's more Canadian than that? So you just want to wrap it in a maple leaf, no exactly. matter how sticky. That makes everything okay. Plus, Argon 18 bikes. They're riding Canadian engineers. Yes, of course they are. And actually, in, a, in the next issue of Canadian Cycling Magazine, we have a feature on Notio, um, a Montreal company, that's helping us stand out with their aerodynamics and their So TTT. pretty much Canada is the reason us is any good. <laughs> you always have these grandiose claims for our country. It's cute. I'm rolling with it. All right. Okay. Next weekend, this weekend coming up. Actually, right now when this podcast is going. Yes, when we're live, when it's in your ears. Yep. The Track World Championships will be live. Yes, and... Can you say the name of the Polish city in which the track cha- world track champs are in? Pruszkow? Not bad, Br- I guess. My, my go at it is Pruszkow. Pruszkow. That's my take. That's um, take. I'm sure I'm still not very correct. But anyway. Um, Do we have a... a- a pronunciation guide to this? We have a minute left to talk about this. Okay. So let's... No, have a minute. So, um... Is track cycling too boring? It can be. Pains me to say that. Full send, no send. It's a full send on this because it could be cool. Like six day racing is fun. You got lasers. You got smoke shows. You got beers in the stands. 
You go to a World Cup and a UCI event, it's not really that. But World Cup events, when you're there, it's a good day out at the track. You see lots of racing. I feel like it just doesn't make it to television or streaming very well. Yeah, you don't quite get like, get a grasp of the speed and, importantly, how slow the sprinters go at the start when they're like, you yeah. know... Or the tactics of the Madison or just the head spinningness of the Madison. Like, you can maybe get a better handle on it when you're there. On television, it's just rider soup. That's, that's it, but you know what? More lasers, more smoke shows. We're out that of would time, do great things but for yes, it. Yes, more six day, more jazz in the infield like back in the day, and we're out of time. Full said, no send, a success as always. About 11 years ago, Coburn and Doug Brown took off on a tandem bike ride. Now, this was just wasn't any tandem bike ride. It was one from the Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia to a Soyuz, British Columbia. That's a long way to go when you're on your own bike. But imagine being on a tandem. These are these are bikes that are known for challenging even the best relationships. Um, in some ways, this trip was on a whim. And in some ways, these guys weren't as prepared as they should be. But I think the what I love about this this story is the lessons they learned, which will apply to any big adventure you're going to take on two wheels, whether that's sharing those two wheels with another person or on your own set. First, we'll hear from Coburn, and then we'll hear from his father, Doug. Uh, I was 14 at the time. Uh, I don't think we <laughs> we didn't really have too much of a plan, actually. Um he it was just something he had always wanted to do and we just had a good excuse to do it so we uh sort of packed our bags and away we went the idea for the bike ride was mine i uh i had always wanted to ride across the country and uh once i had the tandem and uh i was getting a little old it was either now or never the point of the trip was to uh go to a soyuz uh, uh and then on towards Kelowna. The Coburn's uh, great grandmother, his last great grandmother, was turning 90, and uh, they were all pretty close family, so we wanted to go see her. And then I just wanted to do it. I just wanted to see this vast country. Spearville, New Brunswick, just uh, close to Woodstock, is where we started the trip. And then we headed uh, into Quebec, and then from there, northern Ontario and across the prairies. Uh, there was a bit of a timeline. Uh, we had 33 days uh, from leaving Nova Scotia to get to Asoyas, BC. Um, that was when the birthday party happened. At the time I left on a trip, my fitness level probably wasn't uh, as good as it has been in the past. As, as uh, we all know, our, our cycling journey has its ups and downs. And this was certainly not a, a year for uh, putting in a lot of mileage in. I was uh, running a bakery as well as uh, doing a sales job. So I was sitting in a car for six, seven hours a day sometimes, driving through the Maritime, staying overnight in motels. So uh, I started the uh, trip at uh, 185 and I finished at about 160 pounds. So uh, I needed to lose some weight and that was a way to do it. Well, I don't think we had ever been camping together before we left on this trip. And, you know, it was never something that really crossed my mind at that point in my life. Uh, I think, you know, you're still at the point at 14 where you sort of think your parents can do everything and anything, uh, no matter what, even if you've never seen them do it or ever heard them talk about ever going camping before. Um, so I just assumed he, he had it under control. But when I look back at it now, um, yeah, he, I don't think he had set up a tent in 20 or 30 years. <laughs> Uh, the first week, the week and a bit, I can't remember exactly how many days, um, we we were staying in, in tents. We'd roll into a campground uh, after a long day on the bike and you know, sort of fumble around and try and set up the tent. And, um, you know, most campsites, some of them had picnic tables, which was nice. Some of them didn't. Uh, and we really struggled. I can remember not having a place to really sit down except for the ground um, after a long day on the bike. And, you know, you're trying to move around and get food ready and having to either kneel down or squat on the ground. I remember was quite 
challenging, um, even for a 14 year old. So I can imagine what it was like for my father at the time. Um, and it was also quite heavy, you know, it was older camping equipment. So it really took a toll on, on our bike and the trailer we were using to carry things. Uh, and after a bit of a catastrophic failure a week or so into the trip, uh, and you know, some uncomfortableness in the campgrounds, we decided that we'd ditch all of that at a grandparent's house and continue on just going from hotel to hotel. I've always wanted a tandem. I found a good deal on a trip to Maine on one of my sales trips. So, uh, Coburn and I had ridden quite a bit together, uh, off-road and road riding in the Annapolis Valley here. And, uh, the thought was that he'd uh, he spin us out along the flats because he had uh, good aerobic capacity, but he didn't have the muscle mass yet, only being 14 years old, to get up hills. So historically, when we were riding together here, I'd lose him on the hills, and we'd be pretty well matched on the flats. So I thought I could grind up the hills, and he could push me on the flats. It seemed to work out okay. You know, I've heard uh, people call tandems divorce machines. Uh, but for, in our family, it certainly uh, has not been the case. Uh, with Coburn and I, it uh, allowed me not to get frustrated waiting for him on the hills and him not to get anxious and uh, worried about keeping up. And same with when uh, Joy, my wife, and I ride it. Uh, just we can talk. We don't have to worry. We can pedal each as hard as we want. And uh, we don't have to leave, worry about uh, falling behind or getting too far ahead. So it worked out perfect for us. So the tandem... Um... Well, the biggest thing is that it was red, and my father has owned a red Calnago, uh, I think since he was 17 or something. Maybe he was 18. Um, and he's always liked the color red because he believes it makes him go faster. And he just showed up at home with a bike strapped to the roof of our little Toyota Echo, um, which the tandem was about the same length as the car. And yeah, we started riding that around. and Yeah, many positive Aspects of the tandem running, but certainly some drawbacks. The big one was, uh, one of the big ones for me was uh, mental, seeing Coburn sitting up, uh, seeing his shadow sit up in the back of the tandem, taking pictures or chewing on some food, and I couldn't do that. So once we hit the prairies, we worked on it so that we could both ride freehand on a tandem, and uh, I could give my hands a break, my back a break. Uh, the other thing at times, too, uh, it just seemed after uh, working hard or Standing up for a while, it just seemed like somebody uh, dropped an anchor. And uh, at the time, I probably blamed Coburn for not uh, pulling his own weight. But uh, so, yeah, there were issues, but uh, the uh, positives certainly outweighed the negatives. Sometimes, until you get used to it, though, there can definitely be a lack of control uh, until you both understand how the other person really rides. And we had ridden it quite a lot before starting on this trip but even so there was some learning curves uh along the way um and one of them just being how much control or how much influence that person in the back can have and that can be a benefit um if you use it you know if you're aware of it and you've practiced it a lot but the person in the back you know really has to be careful just about how they shift their weight um or how much influence they have over that person up front because it can really affect how the tandem moves um and then also there's a couple days in uh northern ontario and going through the prairies when it would be extremely hot uh and it would be a very long day before you get to get off the tandem and everybody sweats and everybody smells so you're in a uh, very close proximity to each other and that would be a drawback for sure the advice i'd like to give anybody that's trying to do a a trip like this is just uh, to have fun and stay safe. Make sure you have uh, the necessary precautions. Uh, take the necessary precautions as you're riding, just like you do on your normal rides. Uh, and uh, recognize that Canadians, uh, by and large, are more than willing to help people out if you get in a jam. We got uh, we got stuck in the rain, the red, and a cold, miserable rain, and uh, had a broken spoke on a uh, on a tandem. And a woman in the bike store that we went in to get it fixed uh, invited us to her house, did all her laundry, made us supper, and 
send us on our way the next morning. So uh, if you're going to do it, just uh, be sensible about it. You know, I think uh, we probably underestimated the time it would take. So be a little more realistic about your fitness levels and your timeline. It's probably the biggest thing that I would, uh, I would recommend to people trying this trip is uh, we were very fortunate in only having two days of rain on the whole trip. So we got quite lucky that way. I think if we had had a lot more inclement weather, we probably would have been late. But uh, uh, have fun, stay safe, and uh, don't don't overestimate your abilities. I don't know. I I think it's different for everybody, but I think overall, you just sort of need to just jump into it. And uh, you know, I think if my father and I had a thought about it and planned things out too much we we might, we might have realized that oh maybe this isn't a good idea um and it might not have ever happened doug and coburn brown our father and son riding duo from the annapolis valley in nova scotia How much Swain Tuft is too much Swain Tuft? I don't think there is too much. Um, and I hope you agree because we've had him on the podcast quite a few times. And earlier this year, Molly Herford, our contributor, spoke with the legendary, I think it's fair to say, legendary uh, Canadian road cyclist at the Rally UHC Cycling Team Camp. Here are some of Swain's thoughts about riding in the pro peloton and on riding with his new team. Am I pronouncing your name right? Yeah, it's sure? perfect. Okay, awesome. I read up on how to do it beforehand yeah. just to <laughs> yeah. make sure. Um, this is probably a question that's very you know obvious and you get asked it a lot. But how long have you been riding bikes? And how do, do you remember what your first ride was like? Like what made you love it? Yeah, so I would say like re really riding bikes. I would have been about 18 years old. I dropped out of high school. Uh, prior to that and I was obsessed with rock climbing and and getting out into the mountains and a bike was a way to travel for cheap so it started out as a as a means to try and get out to the mountains to climb and and do some adventures and then all of a sudden my first trip I was hooked and that was simply that was a trip going out to like the the coast range which is kind of in uh, you know on the west coast of British Columbia and uh as soon as I got a taste for life on the road, that was that was it. And then uh, for quite a few years, I spent time touring up to Alaska and down towards Mexico. And and uh, I got I was just obsessed with traveling by bike with my dog and the trailer and all that stuff. So I, that wasn't competitive cycling, and I'm I'm certainly glad it wasn't because I don't know if I would have made it as a younger person in a structured world of professional cycling, but. Um, for sure, I was doing some hard biking at that point in my life. So you're just like OG bike bum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think back to that time, and it's like, I think of how I lived, and it's just so crazy. Like, you know, Jonas, we were driving down the 101, and he pointed out the Motel 6 that we stayed in Prime Alliance in 2002, and uh, that was the camp I rode down from Vancouver to to here to basically just got there the day before camp started and it rained every day it was it was like start of february and it was just uh, yeah i was sleeping in the woods bivouac bag and uh going to bed like soaking wet every night uh that was a rough trip but i got through that camp and somehow here i am so what was your first race do you remember it like what point were you like i could do this as a career forget the climbing yeah so yeah um the the one where i really first noticed it would have been uh i would have been like in the cat three or four group in um in a race called uh tour of a new uh, it was an american race in washington and i just rolled solo from from the gun and 
and I think maybe I won by five minutes or something but just really crappy equipment and not knowing how to do really anything to do with road cycling just ride hard so at that point I was just convinced that this is what I'm doing and I never really thought any other way <laughs> so that's amazing. And I mean, as I was like reading through everything about you, I was wondering, it ever occurred to you to get on like a mountain bike or cyclocross or something that was kind of more of that gritty where the bike bums traveling up and down the coast tend to it's, go? It's really strange that, because that is a, that's a great point. I don't know how, why the road stuff appealed to me because it's, I guess I'm a bit of a mixed character because that type A kind of like just smashing yourself and and pushing yourself all the time kind of attracts me and and yet at the same time I'm it's it's also something I'm kind of against as well so <laughs> that's probably a lot of my confusion and internal stuff that's gone on over the years you know trying yeah. to sort out that self about myself <laughs> but I mean all of us have a psychology to why we do stuff and you know, part of why I did those trips is, is that I was, you know, as a young person, you're just trying to figure out who the hell you are. And, and uh, I was really trying to, <laughs> and I certainly found out a lot about myself, but I'm still finding out a ton about myself. So, yeah, I think it's really important for young people to do adventures like that. Yeah. And I mean, <coughs> kind of flash forward to now, it seems like development for especially road, but I mean, every cycling discipline starts so young now. So you have, you know, even kids on rally that are probably the age you were, you know, when you were still just bumming around and having fun on bikes. What kind of advice do you give these younger people who are already on, you know, super intense training regimen since they're 13 years old? Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> and they hate to hear it, but... I always tell them, you know, like I, I didn't start racing until I was 23 and I'm not saying I'm an example to go by or that I have this great knowledge that it's all going to be okay. But I look at the way they're obsessing about, I mean, I'm fortunate I didn't come up in the time of all this data, but I'm, I'm, I, I just feel like by the time a lot of these guys are reaching their, their, where they should be building physical strength, they've already done all the one percenters. There's nowhere to go. And they mm -hmm. know everything about how to train. They know exactly how many watts they need to go up this climb and so on and so forth. But for me, they're just taking away from what they can be down the road and chipping away from the block because it's a long road. Um, I look at myself, I've been fortunate, but you know, I've had a long career only starting when I was 23 years old. So there's no rush. And, and to force yourself when you're young and still developing in my mind, I, like I told you before, I don't think I would have made it. I think that rigid, structured life would have really cracked me. And uh, I just, I, yeah, I see young guys and the seriousness they have. And I respect it because I get how, you know, appealing the sport is to to be up there with the best. And they see some of these, you know, these genetic anomalies come along every now and then. And they want to be like that. But not all of us are like that. And, and so you have to give your body time. And you have to just take the steps in the right way and it's so hard to do i know because modern society has just promoted everything happening right now and and uh you just yeah they want it so so fast but <laughs> if you don't love it forget about it because it's it might take you 10 years before you start making money mm -hmm. <laughs> and if that's what you're after and all that stuff the <laughs> odds let's look at the odds the odds are real slim so yeah it love it first and you know, for me, I never wanted to go to Europe. I would never wanted to look at it as a job. Yeah. I, I just, I loved what I was doing. So it just kind of worked out. I was lucky, but for sure it was, it was more because I was willing to do the time because I, I loved it. <clears throat> awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Swain Tuft is a professional road cyclist on Rally UHC Cycling. He spoke with contributor Molly Herford. And that's the episode. It was put together by Dan Walker, Philippe Tremblay, me, Matthew Piero, and it was produced by Adam Killick. Special thanks to the Ontario Media Development Corporation for its support. Now, if you want to send us more full send, no send ideas, mm -hmm. 
send us an email at podcast at cyclingmagazine.ca. And our Ask a Coach with Peter Glassford will be back. So you can send questions to Peter at that same address, podcast at cyclingmagazine.ca. Now, if you want to know more about what Canadian Cycling Magazine is doing on the web, take a look at cyclingmagazine.ca. On Instagram, we're at Canadian Cycling. On Twitter, we're also at Canadian Cycling. But on Facebook, we're at Cycling Mag. Just to mix it up. Just to keep it cool. Mm -hmm. And remember, download, rate, subscribe on iTunes. Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, tune in, or even an RSS feed. That'll work too. There's so many ways to find No this. excuses. No excuses. Now, who should they tell to download this week, Matthew? Ah, uh, yes. So when you are um, getting snacks ready for watching the, the track world champs in Poland, you're getting maybe some punchki at the Polish bakery. Tell them, you know what? You should subscribe to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. And listeners, please head over and rate and review Five stars help us out a lot. We'll see you on the flip side.